Game Fellas, episode 20. Uh, broadcast this evening comes with a small change but a massive impact. Uh, we've been literally inundated with requests from middle aged women to get me front row and centre. Uh, so don't let it be said that at Game Fellas, we don't give the people what they want. Step into the limelight, the housewife's favourite, and tonight's host, me, Justin Day. Uh, I'm joined by our regular guests and someone a little special. Uh, firstly, uh, he's like a brother from another mother, assuming, of course, I grew up in the film Deliverance. It's Derek Moore. How are you, Derek? I have never squealed like a pig, just so you guys know this. <laughs> and I don't find my cousins attractive. We've, we've not believed that for a second. And uh, secondly, he's, uh, he's like a brother from the same mother, because... He is. It's Soren Day. Evening, Soren. Good evening. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, yeah, not too bad, thanks. Uh, you, you yeah, are, looking forward to this. You're, you're looking trim, sir. Uh, yeah, that's, um, well, I mean, you know, when, you've, when you're not allowed really to go out much apart from exercise, you, you start getting into exercise. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so. It's, it's been most rewarding for many of us in many ways. Um, and finally... We are delighted to introduce our special guest this evening, a man I have needlessly lost to machine gun fire time and time again, a living legend of the British software house, Sensible Software. It is Stu, Stu Cambridge. Evening, Stu. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. How, how are you doing? How's things? Oh, I'm good. I'm very good. Um, I think I need to trim this because I'm beginning to feel like Gandalf but, uh, and this. <laughs> but uh, yes, but other than that, I'm, I'm fine you now. Got me, got me a cup of tea, so I'm good. Well, the entire British Empire was, uh, was built on That's that, right. as we well That's know. Right. So, uh, yeah, What's great tea? to have you. What's tea? There was a, yeah, there was a... Oh, that's that, that cold stuff people took too much fucking sugar into. <laughs> yeah, did you did you see that video that was that was around where there was someone in America was trying to make a cup of tea and they put like loads of milk in it and the microwave it was like oh my word yeah it's crazy a, it's a brilliant viral video that's going around yeah. so um yeah we're gonna go uh, go around let's uh, let's see what everyone's been uh, been playing recently. Um, Last time out, Soren, you weren't you weren't with us, so there is a gap, which means more chance to play play more. Mm -hmm. So, uh, tell me what you've been up to. What've been playing? Um, yeah, so um, so actually, kind of, uh, I mean, this will give our our viewers and listeners a little bit of a peek behind the curtain when I say that. Um, depending on when you watch or listen to our shows, you might feel like larger amounts of time have gone past, but it wasn't actually that long ago that I did that episode with Mark and, uh, and Brazel. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's not actually been that long, but I have been playing some other things. So on that episode, I said about how uh, mostly what's been kind of getting me through lockdown and that is playing Animal Crossing. Well, like the majority of the world. Um, and as good as that is, and I am thoroughly enjoying it, sometimes you do want to just, you know, throw something else on, kind of change up the palette a little bit. Uh, so the timing worked out quite well on this as well. Um, I, I had, I mean, I've got a massive library of games to, you know, backlog of games to get through. So I decided to um, play uh, another Nintendo title, which is, I think it's called Captain Toad's Treasure Tracker. I think it is Treasure Tracker, isn't it? It is, yeah. So it's, um, for, for anyone who doesn't know what it is, it's a game that I think originally released on the Wii U, and it's basically a like a puzzle game, like a 3D puzzle game, um, uh, where Toad from the Mario, you know, family is the, the main character, and it's all about these kind of little, they're almost like little dioramas, like each level is like a little diorama, and you've got a kind of, you can spin it around and view it from different angles, and you move Toad around, and you're just trying to kind of complete the puzzle to complete the level uh it's got you know the, the really nice kind of mechanics of um you know that there's there's um like a, a star for completing it and then there's like another little stamp for collecting all of the diamonds in the level and then the, you know things like that so you can go back and kind of redo the levels um yeah i've been been thoroughly enjoying that um i did get absolutely duped by the fake like the fake ending 
where you go through like about 18 levels and then it gives you literally the credits and it says, you know, like, oh, thank you, you know, well done, you've completed the game, the end. And I thought to myself, that feels a bit stingy for 40 quid. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's, uh, hmm, that was a bit short. I mean, I did enjoy it, but, um, but no, as it turns out, that's only about a third of the game, if that. So, uh, yeah, so I've been playing that. Uh, and then something else. Now, I would have been happy to just stick with that as my kind of palate cleanser from, from Animal Crossing. Um, but then something that had been on my radar, but I had completely, like I'd completely forgot when the release date was. And it happened to be the 5th of June. So it was literally like only, you know, a few days ago. Um, but they dropped Command and Conquer Remastered on mm-hmm. Steam. And, I mean, yeah, Command and Conquer, like that franchise, at, at least up to kind of Red Alert 2 and, and you know, all, all of the kind of early ones, um, that is a lot of my kind of childhood and teen years and, you know, and all of that, just playing those games on the PC, um, absolutely loved them. And so, yeah, as soon as I saw that that had come out, I thought, yeah, I've got to buy that. And so I've, I've only... It? Well, I've, I've only... I've only given it maybe a couple of hours, like two to three hours of play, and already it's it's phenomenal. Like crap, if you... I was in a buying stuff on Steam when I'm on an episode with you and Justin together. <laughs> I mean, I, like it's so for us, it's eighteen eighteen pounds. So I, I assume it would probably be about twenty dollars or so for you, um, something around that. Yeah, it's nineteen ninety nine. Okay, so um, yeah, I I mean, not that I want to constantly like destroy your wallet Derek but I, I, it's an insta buy if you like if you like that franchise and you oh, yeah. especially if you grew up playing those games or you know if, if you remember the originals fondly just buy it it's worth the 20 bucks like you get what is it you get command and conquer one and red alert one plus all See, of their I don't expansions care as much as like the main Command and Conquer, but mm-hmm. I absolutely love the Red Alert series. I even loved Red Alert 3. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, that's the thing. Like, even if you just played the Red Alert content, it's still worth it because you get everything that was Red Alert. So not only do you get the main game and the expansions, but there's even then another section on the mission list, which is any of the missions that were um, console exclusives. So where they kind of released those games on console, like so I, I know they did Command and Conquer One on um, PlayStation One and things like that. So yeah, PS One um, got a port of both games. Yeah, I think they also, uh, in fact, um, yeah, I'm 100 percent sure because I've got it. They um, they did Command and Conquer on N64 as well. So yeah. there are some like console exclusive missions that they've obviously then put on there as well. Um, and it's just everything like they've they've gone in and you know they've made everything look. It, it looks like really nice and really crisp and really clean, but kind of retains that retro feel. And all of like, even all the videos, like I don't even know. I mean, apart from just straight up magic, I don't know how they've managed this, but they've managed to take videos that are probably like, you know, less than 240p. <laughs> like they're, they're so horrible, the horrible pixelated videos that were the original FMVs. I and remember them. <laughs> Yeah, they're like, but they've managed to upscale them to the point where they're, you know, I mean, okay, they do look like they've got a bit of a kind of a smoothing filter on, but but they're way clearer, <laughs> like way way clearer, um, and they're all there. There's like loads of bonus content of um of them recording them, so like where they've got the actors against the green screens and they're doing like multiple takes of things, it, you know, just for kind of like if you're into like your history of it all, it's nice to see all that and you kind of unlock that as you go through. Um, yeah, it's just a fantastic package, and uh, they redid all the music as well. They got the guys in to like completely re-record all of the music, so that's all, you know, now completely like I don't know what the the, the audio version is, but like the high def <laughs> version oh. of audio, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so um, yeah, the whole package is just absolutely oh. fantastic. And if anything, I would say, I mean, I bought it because I knew I'd absolutely love it. But if anything, I would say go out there, buy it, support it because if this sells well, you know they're going to do the oh. same thing to Red Alert too, like that you know, and and Tiberium Wars and things like that. Like they they will carry that on if this sells well enough. 
So. I wonder with the videos, if, if when they created it, they rendered all the videos out at a lot of high resolution to begin with and then downscaled them for the release back in the day. Because I know yeah. as an artist, when I create stuff digitally, if someone wants it, I don't know, HD res, I'll do it at double that or, or 4K, it'll be double that because then I know that it's future proof if someone comes back in a year's time yeah. and they want yeah. another copy but for a higher spec machine. It's like, okay, well, I've got that. So I wonder if that's what they did. Well, they they, they yeah. had all the files in their in their archives and thought, hang on, we'll dig these out and, and just you know, repurpose them for the new release. Yeah, it, it wouldn't surprise me if there was yeah. some of that. I mean, I know that because it's three twenty. Is was it three twenty two hundred the original PC uh, VGA, wasn't it? Yeah, like, it yeah, must have been. Rest. Yeah, it must have been about six forty four hundred four eighty. I'm just so, saying, future mm. generations need to see the FMV stuff from Red Alert too. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Better than the um, sci fi original movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I like that's that's what they do with um, you know, with the movie industry and that. That's why you know we've mm. gone through a lot of you know where you've had films released on VHS and then on DVD and re-released on Blu-ray and then on you mm. know HD or whatever. Like th- that's because they can keep going back to that original film, like yeah. the, the actual thirty-five mil yeah. or whatever it is film, and and rip a better quality you know rip from it yeah. so that it definitely could be could be elements yeah. of that yeah but there's um there's one little feature that i've got <laughs> i've got to mention about it which is really nice and i love that a lot of remasters of retro games are doing this because it's not the first time i've seen it um but i love it when they do it but when you're playing the game at any point you can just tap spacebar and it reverts to retro graphics just mid-mission so you can be right in the middle of it and you can just go boop, tap space bar and then it, it basically, you know, you're moving a few pixels around oh. as your little, <laughs> your little troops. That's cool. And it is, it's beautiful. Cool. Right? It's a really nice package. So yes, cool. hi, highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, I think it's really interesting what you say there about, uh, well, two things that I picked up on there. I love the fact that you referred to it, uh, Captain Toad as a, as a palate cleanser. Like, like, like basically... Animal Crossing was your duty in the world of video games, and you just needed to kind of <laughs> just water something down so you can go back to the farm and whiskey. I mean, I, lo- I love that term. Yeah, um, you're pretty much describing Animal Crossing right now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and that that feature, I, I've actually, I, I'm the same with you. I've come to absolutely love with different games that do that, and I've been fascinated by it. So one of the, I think one of the first games I saw that. Not that it's new, but was like um, the Secret of Monkey Island, mm-hmm. and they did like a the new version, and you could press the button, and it just instantly went to the old version. the The music went back to how it was, mm. uh, the, the the visuals, but even wherever you were on the screen, you could keep moving and almost flick as you. Yeah. Did. Magic, really, yeah. really cool. That's it's cool. it's almost That's like cool. the the old version and the new version are just kind of playing like mm. on top of each other. Yes. So you're controlling both, and you can just tap a button to kind of just flip between yeah. the two. Yeah. So yeah, it's really cool. It's really and cool. Have you have you? Um, I don't. I mean, obviously, I know you very well. You're not. I, I don't know that I'd ever consider you a a purist. So, have you found yourself wanting to play with the older graphics? Or have you, um, or, or how have you found the newer, the newer graphics? Does that work for you, or is there like some nostalgic edge taken off, and that's kind of not weird? So in, okay, in this specific example of Command and Conquer, it's nice to kind of go back and and look at what it used to look like because you know you flip it back to that um, the retro graphics and you're like oh my god I remember exactly you know it does that that nostalgia does flood back. But no, I mean, I'm more than happy to play with the, the the remastered graphics. And I think that's partly due to the fact that they've gone to like what appears to be extraordinary lengths of making every other aspect of the game um, feel like the original, even though they've probably like re... Well, in fact, I know they've got like original voice actors in, like the, the lady that, you know, does all the, um, you know, like unit ready, unit complete, you know, and all of that, like all of the little sound effects they got them back in to re-record them so they're like really high quality mm. recordings now so everything sounds and feels like i remember even though i'm probably remembering you know like i'm kind of looking at the old one through rose tinted glasses a bit and kind of not remembering it as muddy and horrible as it was well, um, to me, so like, these remasters are like exactly what you said it's 
what we remembered it looking like, yeah. not what yeah, it actually yeah, yeah. does going back. Exactly. And like, look at the image. Yes, I bought it. Soren, I hope you get the commission, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> bought it, it whilst we're recording. Like what I remember it being. <laughs> I know yeah. what I'm doing later on. Just yeah. Put it that way. I mean, it is. It is like. And I think, in like I said, in this specific example, because I know there are other other examples of remasters where they, you know, the remaster doesn't look anything like the original. But with this, it's they've kind. Of, it looks like they've put a lot of effort into making everything look and feel how it used to. It's just really like way clearer now. Like it's way more high def. So everything still looks the same, like all all the buildings, all the animations. Because you know when you obviously in that when you build a new building and it does that kind of like almost like a, like a transformer <laughs> where the building kind of like goes and like opens up. Like everything looks and feels exactly how it did, but it just now looks a lot better. So yeah, the the um the retro graphics, like being able to flip back to that is nice. It's nice to kind of just have a little look and kind of be like, you know, oh yeah, I wonder what this level looked like. You know, let me just jog my memory. But no, I'll play the whole game with the the modern the oh. the remaster on definitely. Cool. Oh. In keeping with uh, look, looking looking back at games, and uh, that's what I'm sure we'll be talking to to Stu about. So I think we should move straight to Stu. And uh, and see what you've been what you've been playing. I have no idea what type of game <laughs> guy you are. You could you could play anything. I have no idea. So take it away. Well, I have been revisiting this. Oh, Return to Castle like. Wolfenstein. Mm, there the, we go. That's what I'm so I've been playing that. You um, I'm I've so also... glad to see the forgotten pieces of that franchise get some love. Thank you, Stu. Well, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant franchise, isn't it? I love it. I love the whole, I love the whole like Nazi sci-fi thing going on. I love all that stuff, mm -hmm. uh, and the supernatural stuff as you get through to it. I love all that, and all the all the weird stuff that you can encounter as you get further into the game. I, I've not got that far this time round, but I'm I'm going to get there. Um, the other thing I've noticed is I, I've I've got a 360 down here, and I've got some of the original Xbox games, and I've been playing this. Metal Arms on on the original. I've heard, heard a lot of good about it. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. It's a really lovely little, little game. Um, I love the animation on it. I've also been playing this on and off. Gauntlet on the Xbox, the original Xbox. Yeah, the original Xbox. Mm. And One and of this the most underrated I've, consoles ever. Yeah, I, I I love it, and I'm gonna dig out my I'm gonna dig out my original Xbox because this doesn't work on the 360, and I want it to work because I never completed Tron Tron Killer App Two. <laughs> zero. So I, I started playing this on the original Xbox many years ago when it came out, and I dug this out as well. And I thought, Do you know what? I'm going to try and I'm gonna get my Xbox out, and I'm going to start playing that again. Um, and I've also I haven't been playing a lot, and I've also recently been getting my main collection back up and running, so I can play all the old arcade games. Um, and I've got I dug my little GP2 GP2X out. Ah, it says dropping it. Um, yeah, I dug. Let's start that, that way around. Holy yeah. shit! I had one of those. Yeah, I found this. Um, oh, I had so much fun with that. So, I've got uh, Twitter's brilliant. I, I put it on Twitter the other day that I was trying to find the ROMs for it. And because you know, in May, I don't know if you play Main, but they, every time they release a new version, it seems like all your ROM sets don't work anymore, or half the games decide that oh, we're not going to work on this version. I thought, well, I haven't really got time to, to go around and find all the... I thought, see if anyone on Twitter knows where I can get some ROMs for it. And I was just like, it's just brilliant. People are so kind. I've just got links, and, and it's really good. So one of my one of my jobs later this week is to get all the stuff set up on here so I can sit sit at home and um, and play in the evenings on like all the old Centipede and Galaxians and Space Invaders. Because and, I love all the old retro games, you know, because I suppose, like, with for me, retro is 80s, 80s games. Mm -hmm. That's retro for me. And then you get to the 90s where you're kind of getting into your Mega Drive, your snares. But that was work for me. So mm -hmm. it's not, it's <laughs> retro, but for me, it's not quite as retro as, as like the Atari mm -hmm. VCS, um, yeah. you know, Commodore 64, Atari, you know, all that sort of stuff, Spectrum. So, um, so yeah, and that's basically what I've been doing, you know, um, as far as my game playing is going. But I don't mm -hmm. actually play a lot of new games. And my sons do. They play. They play. I mean, one's got. A, you know, one one's really into the PS4, and one's really into the Xbox One, um, and they play all sorts of things on that. Um, 
but I don't I don't get really get to play a lot of the uh, the new ones. So yeah, so I'm, I'm more I would say my sort of gaming is retro gaming. More than yeah. Retro. And and how how old, how old are your sons? Uh, one's sixteen. Yeah. And one's thirteen. Well, st- you don't look old enough to have children that old. <laughs> Well, so I've, actually got, I've actually got grown-up daughters as well, so... Oh, I, and I'm, you, I know. you definitely don't look that... See, we know how, we know how to treat guests on this show. <laughs> but, no, it's, it's the game. It's all the gaming. That's what it does. It's all the game. Video games. It keeps you young. That's what it is. Video games keeps you young. I mean, if that was the case, Derek Moore, please answer why. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, they've been using stuff like Tetris for doctors. It keeps your brain going, and it's not that stressful, so it has them already thinking logically without inducing stress for doing a surgery, and they tend to perform better. Science, motherfuckers. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, we, we had an interesting debate about this once um, and how something like Minecraft would be a really great educational tool to unlock creativity and... And show sharing. people how to make dicks out of rock. Yeah. <laughs> that's the problem you get people like me teenage versions of me and you <laughs> and him and it's like oh okay all that good good ideas kind of collapsed in on themselves oh no that's uh that's great i i couldn't have i couldn't have guessed i would have said i would have said more a retro fan but i i guess i would because of, because of what i associate you with I, I kind of almost assume that you do nothing but play cannon fodder. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's like constantly sitting there. That's it. no, it's no. so awesome playing myself getting shot. Yeah. You know, do you know what, right? There is a, there is a, um, because at the end of it, when we was developing the game, I, it was hell at the end because we was literally working like every hour to go through bugs. You'd send like a, I mean, this is the days before the internet. So you had to send discs down by co- motorbike courier down to down to London, and then they'd go into test. And we'd have lists and lists and lists of bugs that come in and things that needed fixing. So the, the last probably two two months of development, it was hell. And after we'd got the game out the door, and it'd gone to the publisher, and they said, "Yes, that's it." I couldn't look at the game. I I mean, I, it, I, I I couldn't look at the game for probably at least six months. Yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't load it up, I couldn't play it. Uh, and then it went for about five years after that before I even played it again. Because you spend so long on it. But now I look back and I think, you know, I'm really proud that we we, we achieved all that. You know, it was, it was only three of us working. I was as Jules programmed it, I did the graphics and, and, and John Hare did all the you know did most of the designs, the most of the design and that was it. So and then also got Richard Joseph did to help with the music. It was brilliant, you know. So um it's funny though because people often say to me, "Oh, you know, I'm sorry, I got you killed." <laughs> That's all right. I don't, I don't hold a grudge. <laughs> a, a classic. I love it. I love it. Well, thanks for that, Steve. Um, Derek, you've uh, you've been on even more recently than Soren. So if uh, if what he says to be believed, then you may not have touched any other game unless you've literally just started playing Command and Conquer Remake. <laughs> He's playing it now, isn't he? I cannot confirm nor deny. <laughs> um, I've just been doing overtime a lot lately, so I haven't played much. I started a game on XCOM 2 on Switch because I absolutely love the XCOM games. There's some performance issues, but I don't care because I can play XCOM while I'm taking a shit. I even love the Vita port of the original one. And I did get um, my pre-order at Outer Worlds in, but I haven't played it yet. Other than that, a ton of NHL 3s on NHL 20 with my brother. And, of course, Magic the Gathering Arena because I'm the basic bitch. <laughs> that, was, that was a whistle-stop tour. I almost, that, that's kind of the way I think that your brain works on a daily basis as well. It just goes... <laughs> Jokes on you, you assume it does work. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all I needed to know. That was it. That was uh, that was good. So um, no, good, short and sweet. Um, so to me, um, so I I've uh, <laughs> I have been also palate cleansing from Animal Crossing. Um, I I have reached that point of the game where I think I'm going to kind of drop off a cliff a bit now. I've done kind of the major parts I wanted to do. It's been fantastic. I will keep kind of dipping in and out, but what's done is done. And, you know, I put 180 hours odd into that. 
Um, you know, B Billy, my son, I think he's knocking on the door 400 hours. Uh, Evelyn, my daughter, she's on 200, 220. Like, yeah, this is this has been well worth the 40 quid. You know, we've, <laughs> we've got our money's worth out of that one. Um, so, so I've been playing the original Super Nintendo version of uh, Trials of Mana, which is the follow-up to The Secret of Mana. Uh, it's also known as The Secret of Mana 2, and it's also known as Saiken Densetsu 3, if you're all keeping up with that. I'm sorry, can we, can we just get Derek to pronounce that? Yeah, he's good with that. Suck my Ditsu. Seiken <laughs> <laughs> uh, Setsu 3, I played it a shit ton on DS and ES. I mean, said like it was intended, I'm sure. Mm. Um, yeah, it's... I, and, and it's funny, we were talking about the, the, like, the purist thing earlier, so when I, I talked to Soren about this, and I, um, I'm about... Thanks. I'm about 75% of the way through the game, I reckon. And... He, when we were talking about it the other day, he said to me, why have you gone and played that? And like, they've literally just released the remaster. And it's, I'm not a purist either, but I, I want, in order to feel I could appreciate the remake, I wanted to play the original. Now, does that mean I will go straight and play the remake? Does it mean I'll ever play the remake? I don't know. But that just wouldn't quite have worked for me. Uh, I think part of the, the joy of a remake is is a, a nostalgic kickback or a memory or a, oh, oh, that's cool how they've done that. And to me, it would have just been brand new. So I think a lot of what they put into that game may have been wasted. So yeah, I've been playing it on, I've actually been playing it on the collection of Mana, which is uh, on, on the Switch. Um, so I, I sent, uh, it's essentially emulate. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm enjoying it. Um, I've, read reviews that suggest that it's it's held in higher regard than the secret of manner um i'm not having any of that um as a massive fan of the original secret of manner but i think some of that might be because i played the secret of manner in the uh early 90s and i'm playing this in 2020 so it's not quite the same um but a great game nonetheless one thing I would say for anyone who, who uh, listens to this and thinks, oh, yeah, I'd quite like to play that, or I'm going to get around to playing that, is uh, I didn't realise it was actually a bit of a joke on the internet <laughs> until I realised I was part of this joke, is that there doesn't appear to be a, an instruction manual. And you'd think, hang on, I've played games for 30 years. I'm, I know that one button is hack and slash, and one bricks are a menu system, and one casts magic, and I can work this all out. No. Not, not as all it believes. Uh, it actually is infamously poorly translated from the original, and things don't actually make as much common sense as, as you may think. Um, and people have actually made uh, effectively fan-based instruction manuals, and like not even guides, <laughs> just to just to give you an idea of what to do. <laughs> um, sometimes it's not quite as obvious as it seems. Um, so uh, yeah, but I've uh, say I've been really really enjoying that. Haven't had much time to play anything else since the last time we spoke, but I'm I'm really glad I took that on. Yeah, I'm just uh, I think I'm filling a gap until Paper Mario comes out. But um, with that uh, with that concluding, we move straight into our first topic. It's not strictly a topic. It's our interview slash topic, our intervopic, which. Uh, which I'm, I say, absolutely delighted that we've got uh, Stu here today. So for those that don't know, uh, I'm guessing that's largely our American audience, uh, we, we had uh, computers that weren't games consoles that weren't also produced by Sega or Nintendo that were the, the height of fashion in the 80s and the 90s and, and bore the fruit of the bedroom coda. And if you grew up, in, uh, in the United Kingdom and were lucky enough to grow up in the, the era that we grew up in, you would have been absolutely, absolutely familiar with a British games company called Sensible Software. No less do we have ourselves an Amiga <laughs> on the screen right now. There it is. I'm, without looking, I'm going to guess that's a 500 plus. Am I wrong? It is. It's a 500 plus. Yeah. There we go. Hey, there we go. Uh, 
Not that. even yellowed at all. Oh, look at that. That's for the yeah. kickstart. So I've got 1.3 and 2 in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> and and here's, here's the joy. If you grew up in that era, you, you knew Sensible as a software company. But more importantly, you will have at least heard of one of two games, which actually is not fair based on the myriad of software that came out of that company, but it shows you just how important they were and how great they were at that time, is that if you said Sensi to anyone, Sensi meant sensible soccer. And for those people who grew up at that time, everybody edited teams, everybody had very small pixelated players, and nobody cared about anything that would become FIFA, Pro Evo, or the rest of the world. So... Stu, so we'd love to talk to you all about the very, very beginning and, and go through all of those things. So, oh, nice. so for me, I guess the start is, where did you first get an interest in computer games? Without giving your age away, because we've already said you're about mid-30s, <laughs> without, without giving the game away, what, what was the, the first draw for you? What, what got you into, what grabbed you, what was it? Uh, well, it was the when was it early eighties when the I suppose you'd call it the microcomputer revolution started in in the UK, um, and uh, I mean my cousin had a ZX eighty one, you know, which was rubbish really when you look at it, um, and I thought well that's that's cool, and then everyone started talking about like you know Vic twenties and Ataris, so I actually asked for a Vic twenty for for Christmas. Um, and my dad got me this my mum and dad got me this Vic 20 for Christmas and I wanted a Commodore 64 but you know they said well we'll get you a Vic 20 and then if it's just a fad then it, you know we haven't wasted loads of money on it and I really got into it and the first game I got was by Jeff Minter I got Abductor and I got Laser Zone uh, and I couldn't play Laser Zone because we didn't have the RAM expansion so I had this game and funny things I've actually gotten behind me because I've been clearing out so wow. that is the first game I got for the Vic 20, right? And I love when a guest brings stuff with him. It's awesome. <laughs> okay. But this one, it needs, I think it needed 8K. I think it needed 8K RAM expansion. We know the Vic comes with like 5K, which is rubbish. Mm. Um, and I got this, I, I set it all up and I was playing Abductor and I was just like, wow, this is like an arcade machine. You know, I mean, when I was a teenage boy, so I'm like, yeah, this is like an arcade machine. And I thought, I want to do this. I want to do this for a living. I want to, I want to make games. And that, that really is what, what really sort of got me into that whole idea of, like, well, how, how do I go about programming? How do I go about doing graphics? How do I go about doing this? And you just go through and you just pick books up and you look at magazines. And that's, that's literally how I got into it. Um, and then you went to, you know, went to some, some computer game shows that we had in the UK and uh, got to see Jeff playing all these games and seeing other people doing their games and seeing stands of all this new stuff coming out. And I was like in awe. I was like, you know, this is like heaven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and as a teenage boy, you know, there's no internet. There's no, there's no like, you know, on-demand video. There's no on-demand music. It was all very, you know, you, you, you sit there in, in front of your machine and you literally just, hammer away until you produce something um and 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 that's 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 where it all started really for me you know and i think that story is probably quite similar to a lot of people in, in of my generation who got into the games industry in the uk any, anyway because i think everyone was had the same kind of path where they, they had a spark of an interest and then they just take it a little bit further a little bit further um i mean i i chose to go the art route um, but I did actually start off programming. That's where I, I did start off, you know, my, my quest to become a video game developer was, was programming. Um, so, yeah. And that, and that, I mean, did you start with basic or did you learn something else and go from I, there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I did. I, I, uh, I mean, Commodore Basic's known for being pretty rubbish. So I, I did start learning basic on the Vic. My mate, he's had had a pet, Commodore pet which just looked fantastic as a machine. Even now, it's like a, a real iconic image, isn't it, the Commodore Pet? It looks like what you think a, a yeah. computer from 80s sci-fi would. Yeah, it's a crappy-ass keyboard. 
yeah, definitely. And it, it, it is, and I, I, in fact, I'd love to have one here because I think if you, you know, it just looks the business. Um, and he, he was, he um, had some basic programs on that. And I think he had Space Invaders on it that was written in basic. And then I got home, well, I went to my friend's house one day and I saw that and I thought, well, how does that work? How did they do that? So I tried to do it on my Vic and Vic was really slow. It wasn't particularly great, you know, running anything particularly fast because the basic on it was pretty rubbish. So then I realised that all the games like, like this and all the other ones are written in machine code. And I think even a lot of them say on there, written in 100% machine code, a lot of them used to say. Um, and I thought, well, what is this machine code? You know, what does that mean? Um, so I, I then looked into, um, you know, what, what that meant. It meant assembler language and, you, you know, you code the, code the chips directly. So I got into assembler, uh, 6502 on the, on the VIC-20 a little bit. Didn't get far with it because my brain was hurting. All the, all the data statements and all the other than that. So I left it. Assembly's a bit. Yeah, it really, it really was. So, especially on something like a Vic, which, which, which was a bit naff. I mean, the screen was like 20 characters wide, which is shit. Absolute shit. So, I thought, well, okay. Then, the, I think the following Christmas, or was it the Christmas after, uh, the Commodore 128 was launched. And so, I skipped from the Vic 20 straight to a Commodore 128. But, of course, I, I, I went, most, most of the time was spent in 64 mode. So um, I got into using that as for assembler language and, uh, and, and I got into writing some code on that and I, I did some sort of sprite routines, scroll routines, um, all the sort of usual stuff that you'd expect to do on a 64. Wasn't that good at it. I know I'm not going to pretend I'm a brilliant coder because I'm not. Um, but I, I really got a kick out of doing all the graphics. Um, and then, then the uh, Sensible software, which was bizarre at the time, released the shoot 'em up construction kit. And I thought, oh, that might be quite cool just to profile some ideas. So, uh, and I've actually got that over there as well. <laughs> so I've got this on disc. Oh, wow. Uh, which is on disc I as love well. those vinyl record style cases from back then. Yeah, but, but hang on. So I got this and I, and I got it originally just to profile some ideas because I was coding a shoot em up on the 64. And uh, look at that, it's an original oh. disc. It's a five and a quarter inch disc. Yeah, look. So that thing's um, worth more than my car, probably. <laughs> the cool thing is, it, it allows you to profile some ideas. So I did this game called Battle Ball, and um, I thought, well, I know what I do. I'll see if someone can well, wants to publish it. You know, a bit cheeky because the shoot 'em up construction kit games are all a bit kind of samey. So uh, I took it around some publishers, and most of them said, "No, you're, you're having a laugh, mate. You know, you're having a laugh. This ain't going to happen." So, I mean, that's the instructions. Look at that. That's crazy, isn't it? So, I mean, that is... Look that's at cool, that. isn't it? How cool is that? That is... I mean, look at, look at the quality of that. I'm the, I'm the kind of nerd that would die in a ditch to get a copy of that off of eBay. That, that's the sort of... <laughs> that, oh, so, that is amazing. So, um, so one company went, I went to, and they said, yeah, we'll publish it for you. And I went... I thought I was having a joke, because... And they said, yeah, no, we'll publish it. So um, I signed the deal, got my check, um, <laughs> and they went under. <laughs> Amazing. But I'd cashed the check before they went under. And I so, knew it was everything. And, which, and, I mean, like, you, I was so quick going to the bank with that check in my hand. I'm, I'm like, stick it out. Got still, it paid in. Sorry to it be like really, really personal. Could you, sh could you share what that was at that time? What, the way much I got? Yeah, um, I actually found the letter yeah, because I don't know if you know games that weren't where Frank Gaskin runs it. I do. He's got Battle Ball on that website because <laughs> I found the discs a few years ago and he, he, he archived them for me. Brilliant. And the other day, because I've been sorting out some boxes, I found it and they was offering me 400 quid. But I'm pretty sure that was the first letter I got from it, and I'm pretty sure I got a little bit more than that. Because I know the Amiga was about 1,400 quid at the time, the Amiga 1000, mm. which I bought. And I thought, I don't remember spending a 1,000 pound, or I don't remember saving up a 1,000 pound for it. Because I remember I, I must have had about 600 quid saved up. So I'm pretty sure it was a little bit more than that. So it probably was about five, 600 pound. That is amazing. And how, sorry, how old were you at that time? Uh, that was in 1980, 1988. So I'm, I'm, 50, I'm 50 now. So... 
We'll bleep uh, that in post, don't worry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. We let it out. Yeah. No, it's fine. I don't care. That's um, that's a, I I love that. And and um, and ultimately yeah. it goes it goes on towards being a contributing part of you getting an Amiga. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because that one decision to buy to buy this just purely to profile some ideas. You know, I had no idea I was gonna sell something with it. I just thought, well, it'll be a quick way of just trying some ideas out. Um so then I got I got the Amiga 1000. Um, my mate my mate had one. Um, he got one as soon as it came out, and I, went, I remember going around his house, and I was just blown away by this machine. Uh, and I thought I, I I really 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 want to get one of them. And I've still got that. I mean it's down there somewhere. Um, and I, and I thought I really really want to get this machine because it was something like from the future. You know the Amiga when it first appeared was like nothing I'd ever seen. Uh, and, and as I say, I got Battle Ball published and they went under. So I didn't even get the cassette that would have been finished. I was a bit gutted because I thought at least they, if they'd have got it mastered, I'd have, had, I'd have actually had a physical copy, but it didn't yeah. even get to that stage. You know, I'd got the, I'd got the money and then they, they disappeared. So um, but I often think what would have happened if I hadn't have got that check off them? Yeah. You know, I probably would have got an Amiga, but I would have probably taken a little bit longer. But then would that have had an effect on my portfolio I'd built up on it, which had then got me the job at Sensible? Yeah, so, I, can, um, I can quite believe that. I'm a, yeah. I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of the, the butterfly effect, things yeah. happening for a reason and how these things kind of become dominoes. And you end up looking back on things like this and going, wow, that, that one decision. You know, or, or even the little bit that you said, which is you got the check and then they went bust. And you're like, I need to cash this and get the money before they... The administrator's coming. <laughs> I love that. Things you couldn't do nowadays. No. Yeah. No. no, absolutely not. That's true. And, and so, and so that, that sort of, you know, it, it's great hearing what is quite um, a common story of that, of that time of how that, I guess it was so new for everyone. I mean, for me, I, my, my brother is, what, well, my older brother, not sorry, is, now you won't appreciate me saying this but he's 52 and and he was at home when i was born and so i was kind of as i was a, this, this toddler growing up i was seeing someone constantly attached mm. to this this new this, this new thing so I, I had nothing but to learn and you know i it's funny you mentioned jeff minter as well because you, one of my kind of i suppose gaming early gaming idols would have been jeff minter you know anything that had anything to do with sheep or camels or anything. So attack and camel sheep in space was one of my favorites on the Commodore yeah, 64. Like sheep in space. Um, you know, I can see how they've become massive influences. You step forward and mm. I can also see, you know, that jump and we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a bit later about the Amiga being mind blowing compared mm. to th those other, those other computers. So, so as we get into the, the late eighties, and we're, we're coming into the sort of the, the, the start of the, the new decade. How, uh, talk, talk to us about Sensible. What was Sensible? Sensible were established by this time and, and had games yeah. like Whizball, which people are familiar with. What, yeah. what, was well, the, what was the journey into Sensible like? There is, a, there is a really weird, almost serendipitous moment where I look back on, because I lived, I lived in a place called Ilford in Essex, all right? And I didn't know until years later that John and Chris from Sensible rented a flat or a house in, in Ilford in Essex. Right. And I walked down the road with my mum going to walk into the town and they will, and I'm sure they walked past me not knowing. I didn't know who they were until afterwards, but I remember seeing them because they had long, Chris had long blonde hair and Jops has got long, like brown, dark brown hair. Yeah. Um, and so for me, I was a big fan of Sensible in the, in, on the 64. I used to play Parallax, Whizball. I mean, I completed Whizball over a weekend. I mean, I've, I've told this before, but I, I, I'd set my, my one to eight up and I told my mum, do not go into my room. I've got, because you couldn't save the game. You know, you, I mean, you know, like today, you take it as, as, as for granted that you just hit a key or, or push a button and you save progress. But with a 64, there was no save progress. You know, you might have, on some games, you might have had a code you could type in. But 
So I remember saying to mum, don't go in my room. Don't put the vacuum cleaner around. Don't do any dusting. <laughs> just leave it because if you knock the power lead, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go mate. I'm going to go really mental because I've been playing this game for like I don't think people will ever understand what it was like in that era again. No. It's like, yeah, saving yeah, was right. a luxury. Yeah, exactly. So it was, it was, it was a pure luxury having I mean, some kind of safe feature. Um, and I completed Wizball. Um, so as obviously as we're getting through to the, to the sort of mid eighties towards the later part of the eighties, um, you know, the one, two, eight came out. I had one, two, eight. Uh, then you saw on the horizon, like, you know, Sega, Sega were bringing out like, the master system, Nintendo had the, had the NES. And I never really got into the consoles. I bought a NES a little bit later, but I bought it more as a machine that was discounted because it wasn't on sale anymore. But the Genesis come out, uh, Mega Drive, and I got one of them. I got an imported one from Japan. I still got that. That's over there. I play with that quite often, actually. That's that's a, a really, I'm a big fan of the Mega Drive. Nice. Um, and I got that. Uh, and then I got I got a, a Super Nintendo as well later on. Then I saw in an advert in one of the magazines there was advertising for um, um, various people, you know, do to do. Uh, you know, like graphics and stuff. And I tried a few, but no one was interested. Um, I got the Amiga, uh, bought the Amiga from this, from this money. Now I was working as a technician for the railway at the time. I was a signal technician. So I was doing all like the electrics and stuff on the signaling and the, and the points and all that. And my mate, he was, he'd actually had a couple of projects pu- sort of published. Uh, and I went around his house and he had somebody he knew who was a programmer. And he said, oh, I've got um, a company I'm working with. They're after some artists. Well, I'd had my Amiga about, I don't know, two or three months. And I'd, I'd built up a little portfolio of work. So he said, Do you, you know, if you give, give him your disc, they, they, might, they might, you know, use your work. And I said, all right. So I gave him a disc and that was it. So I, I, got, a, I got some freelance work doing some games for this other company, Impressions. And then that allowed me to get into the industry properly because my first foray with the 64 stuff had died because obviously the publisher had gone under. Um, so fast forward a little bit, where, where are we now? We've probably been to the late 80s, early 90s, uh, probably about 1990. Um, and, <laughs> and I saw this, this, uh, this uh, weekly or bi-weekly magazine, and there's an advert from Sensible Software in the back asking for programs and artists. And I thought, shall I, shall I send a disc in, you know? Oh, oh no, they won't want my work, you know. I'll, I'll send it in. I was having an argument with myself. Did I send it in? No, don't go. So I sent this disc in, got an interview. And then, of course, the interview then led to me being offered the job. And uh, it was like, this is like, this is crazy, you know. How, how does a, you know, how do I get a job with sensible software? <laughs> um, but then, as you, you know, as you go through, you realize, well, you know, the work I was doing, I've always, I've always maintained a look that is very, I suppose, influenced by the arcade machines of the time. You know, a lot of, a lot of the work I, I produced on the Amiga, I, I always wanted it to look smooth and I always wanted it to look like it'd come out of an arcade, if I could. So um, I was a big, big, really big into anti-aliasing, you know, which, uh, and even today when I see pixel art and it's not anti-aliased, I go, ah, it's not pixel art, you know. It's, it's, but that in itself, has become the art form on un, un, un anti alias pixel art has now become the art form of pixel art. Whereas for me, that's, that's not finished. You know, you need to put little bits of shading in and all that sort of stuff, which we did back then to kind of disguise the fact that it was blocky. Um, so anyway, I, I digress a bit. Um, so anyway, I got this job with Sensible uh, and that was me in, in, that was the start of the 1990s. That was like 1990, 1991, I think that was. So yeah. yeah. And we, um, I, tr- I must confess, I tried, uh, I- I'm going to show myself up here. I tried to do a bit of research on this. And if, if I'm right, was, mm-hmm. one of your, was one of your first jobs at Sensible, not just the one that everyone probably knows is, is going to be cannon fodder. Mm-hmm. Were, were you responsible for porting Megalomania to the Mega Drive? Yeah. Yeah, so this is was... this is a this is a special moment for us because like all video gamers we we all have this top top three top five top ten and and I can honestly say that 
Soren's number one game of all time is the Mega Drive version of Mega cool. Mega. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and that this, we're not, not saying this just for the sake of saying this. And uh, we're, when, we, when we found this out, there was genuine thrills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we, well, the story around that is, um, I say I joined in... I should know this really, shouldn't I? It was 1991 and Megalomania was still being finished on the Amiga. Uh, Chris was still writing it. And in fact, I'd bought an Amiga 2000 uh, before I joined Sensible. And um, it was an Amiga 1500, but they, because Commodore UK rebadged it as 1500, but it was really an Amiga 2000 because it had like one mega chip RAM. Um, and Chris had sent me a disc. When I went up to him, he said, oh, would you mind testing this on your Amiga for me? Hang on, this is this is mad. Like sensible <laughs> software are giving me a disc to try on my Amiga. You know, <laughs> it's like crazy. Um, so when I joined, that game was being finished. So once once I'd actually started, obviously the publisher wanted to release it on other other formats. And sensible said, "Well, we'll do it in house." So I got the gig of doing the graphics conversion from the Amiga. And that was a fantastic job. I, lo- I absolutely loved doing that, that project. I really, really loved it. I love the Mega Drive. I love the machine. Um, I, I just think it's, I think it's got everything right. The only, the, only, the only criticism of the Mega Drive, I think, is I wish it had a little bit more of a, a bigger color palette. Because um, when you look at something like the Super Nintendo, which has got like 32,000 odd colors, you know, Mega Drive's got 512. So it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not quite the same. But... Having Stu, said that, you know, I Stu, do, I do love the Genesis. Stu, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Um, so if, obviously, so you did um, uh, the artwork and... Well, I, and convert, that for, I converted, or converted the artwork. The artwork. Yeah. So yeah. would you have been responsible for, or would you at least know the reason why the characters are different in the Mega Drive version to the other versions? Um, there is actually a, um, a Japanese version which had different characters where they actually had like real kind of manga esque characters put in it. Um, the, which I, I never liked. I never liked, I don't know why they did that. It didn't work for me, but I don't know. I mean, do, uh, cause I'm, I've, I always thought they were the same. Cause I'm trying same. to remember. Anime is garbage. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I mean, I can, I can take it or leave it to be honest with that look. It's, it's I'm not trying really to remember. Um, cause I, so, for no apparent reason, like I don't, not even that it was my favourite colour or anything, but I just used to always be blue in that right. game. So I only ever saw the red, yellow and green armies. And I think I've got a feeling that red and green were the same on both. But right. but the yellow, the yellow, for some reason, I, I know that um, at least on the SNES version, the yellow is like a kind of a blonde, handsome looking chap. And then on yeah. the Mega Drive version, it's um, it's like a, a guy with a black beard and he's wearing a yellow crown. I know that for some reason oh, those two are different. I think the red, the red avatar and the green avatar are, are the same in that the red was like a, a woman with um, like red hair. Yeah. And uh, green is um, uh, Chris Kamara, the famous footballer. <laughs> Uh, I've got, I've actually got the files on my machine here. Hang on. Um, of course he has. God, he's just got onto hand. <laughs> this is cool as shit. Yeah, this is the best ever. Yeah, I'll just go, um, and just, just go and open it up. You've got Scarlet, Oberon, Caesar and Madcap. Yeah, you've got the yellow guy with the crown on his head. You've got the, the girl with the red hair. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you've got, yeah, you've got the green guy and you've got the, the blue guy who had this weird kind of cyborg thing over his eye. Yeah, yeah, he's um, like, a, like a cyborg yeah. pirate. But I don't, I don't recall them being different to the Amiga. Um, I, don't know, I mean, maybe, maybe those ones are the same as the Amiga, and it was the SNES that had different ones. Maybe then. it was the SNES because we didn't do the SNES one. Um, that might be. We it. didn't do the SNES version. I think, I think that was outsourced to somebody. Uh, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, um, but it was, it was a great, it was a great project to work on because the. The Amiga has got a totally different machine architecture to the Mega Drive. So, and I won't get too technical because it probably bore the pants off of everybody. Um, but you've got an Amiga, which has got like, you know, uh, bit planes, which is like big sheets of graphics. Whereas the Mega Drive stroke Genesis uses like tile maps. So you have lots of little squares and you have to kind of reference them, you know, to make up an image using lots of different tiles. 
and it's limited memory. So we had to kind of squeeze a huge amount of stuff in a small amount of space. Um, and I think we did a pretty good job of it, actually. I think we did a really good job. I'm really pleased with the way it came out. And uh, it, it certainly, I think it certainly plays really well, doesn't it, on the Mega Drive? You know, it's... Uh, oh, yeah. I, even, I, even without the mouse. I mean, even though the Amiga used the mouse, mm. you know, playing it with a, with a, with a joypad, it, 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 it kind of works. You know, it does work. Uh, yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that because as someone who didn't have any experience with Amiga, when I went back and played stuff on there in emulation later on, yeah, it's striking to me how much Genesis and that looked the same. I was going to ask, was it pretty simple to port between Amiga and Mega Drive slash Genesis or back and forth? Um, the, the code was because they used the same process, the 68,000 processors. So the actual game logic and all the game code was the same code as far as I know. The only difference is the graphics side of it where you're, you know, the, the Mega Drive's got lots of hardware sprites. It's got, scroll, it's got scrolling play fields, uh, limited video RAM, uh, different sound chip. Um, but graphically, it was more a case of me redrawing stuff. So a lot of the graphics came across straight away because the, the, resolu the resolution of the screen on the Amiga is pretty similar to the Mega Drive, 320 across. The Mega Drive is, I think, 224 down, whereas the Amiga is like 240. Um, but the problem with the, with the uh, Amiga to the Mega Drive conversion was some of the big backgrounds, like you know, maps, the other big map that you play on, that was a big bitmap on the Amiga, whereas on the Mega Drive, we couldn't do that. That would have filled up the whole of the VRAM if we'd have done that. So we had to kind of make a little map up and kind of like tile it like that and, and do lots of little fiddly bits. So I actually reconstructed all of those graphics on the Mega Drive using an editor. So uh, I redrew, drew, redrew a lot of stuff. And also the intro, I don't know if you remember the intro with the different um, drawn scenes where it tells you the story. Well, they were all scaled down for the Mega Drive and they were originally 32 color. Well, the Mega Drive hasn't got 32 color display mode. So it's only got play fields of 16. So we had to split, I had to split those graphics into two sets of colors. And like, you know, that would be 16 colors. That'd be another 16 colors. And they'd overlay and where the gaps were, that's where the bits would filled in. So you'd end up with 32 colors. So we did that on the Mega Drive as well to make it look like it was the Amiga version. Um, that's, that's really but, cool. But that's all the stuff you had to do back then. Yeah, you know, that's I mean, yeah, I mean, oh, oh, I mean so, so the thing is, I mean, I think game development these days, it's, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's like everything is there. It's like, you know, if you want to learn how to do something, you go, da 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 da, YouTube, how do I do that? Right, okay, that's how I do that. Uh, how do I do this? YouTube, how do I do that? There's a video on YouTube that shows you how to do it. Whereas back then there was none of that. It was like, well, how do we, how are we going to do this? It's like, well, I don't know. How are we going to do it? It's like, you know, uh, what should we do? Oh, well, let's try that. Okay. Is that going to work? Yeah, that'll work. Right. You try it. And then it, it works. So there's a lot of stuff that we did. We, we just kind of made up as we went along. So it's, it's, um, you know, but yeah, a lot of this stuff, it's all, it's all part and parcel of, 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 of converting from one machine to another, you know, I wish we'd have done more Mega Drive, Mega Drive stuff in-house, to be honest. I mean, we did Sensible, Sensible Soccer on the Mega Drive as well in-house. Uh, and I worked on that as well. Um, but I wish we'd have done Cannon Fodder in-house. I don't think we did. I don't, we didn't do the Cannon Fodder in-house. And I wish we had, you know. Uh, but it's all to do with finances. You know, you've only got so much time. You know, you spend so long on a project. You know, financially, it doesn't add up to, for everyone to do every project that's for every format. You, you just can't do it. You just can't do it. Did yeah. you have any part of the MS DOS port of Cannon Potter? Because that's the get first game when they mentioned your name that I knew of. No, um, I, 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 I've got a bit of a love hate relationship with that version, to be honest, because I think they they buggered up a lot of my graphics on it. Um, so, <laughs> so well, that's a reasonable concern. <laughs> Because if you look at the loading screen, someone's got a bloody blur filter and gone on the kill, you know, and I've took like colors, some of the colors in game, they've kind of done some kind of effect to them. I'm thinking, well, what's that all about? You know, I mean, what, what's the point? You know, yeah. it's, um, I don't have a problem in heart, people enhancing stuff, but I always found that this, this goes back to that, that era when you did conversion work, you'd always get someone who did a conversion of a project. And they'd want to put their mark on it. 
And I think a lot of that went on with conversions of our stuff and certainly other stuff that other developers had. You know, you would never get a, a, a conversion that was exactly the same on every format because the conversion house would say, well, we're going to put our little stamp on that. So those graphics there are green. We're going to make them a slightly more bluey green or those sprites are like that, but we're going to make them a little bit different because we can put our mark on it. And if you go through a lot of projects, when you look through like you look through like the archives, you'll see that goes on quite a lot on a lot of conversions from different machines of the of that era. You know, they're all slight. Sometimes you get slight differences. Yeah, another and, bit of uh, trivia. That's a great. That's a great bit of trivia. I love that. <laughs> and 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 rather than talk and, and go sort of into the the more you know obvious topic of let's talk about cannon fodder, let's talk mm. about sensible in 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 the in the depths. Taking that up one layer, how? Yeah. How did it feel at the time? And then I'm going to ask the same question to how does it feel looking back that you were part of a team mm -hmm. that was responsible for two of, maybe one of, let's go with Sensible Soccer, that was a defining game for tens of thousands of people in a generation. How did that feel to you then? Because you must have been aware of it. You must have been aware of how big this thing was. Really no, not. Not not when it was being developed, no. Uh, I mean I I I Jules and myself were working on Cannon Fodder. Um, and Chris and uh, Chris Chapman and John Hare were working on Sensible Soccer in the same office. Um, so I could see the development I mean I was sit, like sat here and then I obviously Chris was over there. So from my desk, I could see what he was doing. We said, so I could see sensible soccer being developed. Um, and I'm not into football. This is the, this is the, the, the ironic thing is I'm not, I'm not into football at all. Love the game. Love playing sensible soccer. It's a brilliant, brilliant video game, but I'm not into football in any way, shape or form. So all the guys in the office were into it. So they'd have like all the bloody football planning when there's a big match on. They'd have bloody, you know, and I'd be like, I ain't into all that shit. I, you, you sort yourselves out. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Um, so, so at the time, so yeah, it's just a football game. But once the first one had come out and it started to sell, it's like, oh, there's something in this, you know. And I never worked on the original. I never, you know, I, I've, the only thing of mine in the original game is the little, the little sensible software logo, um, the little one, the little which comes up, the tiny little one, mm -hmm. um, because Jops um, was doing one, and I, I'd already drawn one for Cannon Fodder, and I said, "We'll use this one, and I'll just change it to the palette that you're using for for Sensi Soccer." And that's what I did. I gave him that, and that was it. Um, I only worked on the Sensible Welder Soccer, which came out a couple of years later. Which, which for people of the time, and again, for, for people who are listening, this was the defining version of this mm, game. Yeah. Because yeah. this had a management mode, which for many people, actually, you, you, could, you could be a, a manager, a player manager, or a player. And I, I, I have, actually, I have a story for you. I'm going to give you a quick story. We're interviewing you, not me. We, oh, me, me and a friend, and this shows you, this, I'm going I'm to come on to a question to do with this. Me and a, a, a friend fondly talk about this ridiculous run we had on Sensible World of Soccer, and we got towards the end of a season. <laughs> God, Lord knows who we were. I don't know. Probably Norwich. And we, we had an injury crisis and had to go and find a cheap striker. And we still today talk about this guy that we signed, whose name was Dave Bamber, go with it. And we were like, and whatever. Anyway, he came in the last few games, <laughs> did a job, we won the league, whatever. And to this day, I mean, we're talking 25 years. <clears throat> we talk about this guy called Dave Bamber. And only this year, I went to, to find out who he was. And he, he's a real guy who- in He's real? Post, in his post-playing days, basically runs his own like painting and decorating uh, oh, business wow. in like either Hull or Blackpool or something. And I'm like, <laughs> this, this, this whole story that we've created, <laughs> this legendary story that we always talk about because of that game. And this guy is just like a painter decorator. So there, I just want to thank you guys at Sensible for calling the game what it is and not football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point as well. Um, no, so yeah. So and I don't even like American football <laughs> or so, soccer. Yeah. <laughs>
So you, so you guys didn't have, did you, did the, so it started to grow the kind of understanding that this was obviously, you know, sales must define mm. that there's a popularity, um, then into sensible world of soccer. And this has a real, a real gathering. Did, I mean, you, did you know by then? Cause you must've done this was like the next version. So you must've thought, wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I mean, I say I, I, I only really worked on sensible world of soccer. Um, but I, I could see the scale of the project, how, how the, the whole of the, uh, the game had become its own entity, really, if that, if that makes sense, where it had become its own, its own kind of almost its own bubble. It's in its own bubble where, you know, and its own kind of universe because fans were, you know, were, were buying it left, right and centre. Um, and I knew for a fact that the, the additional stuff that was going into World of Soccer, because I was in the same office as Chris, who's writing it, so I could see what was going on. I could see them, you know, all the bugs and all the edits and all that sort of stuff was going on. Um, you could see that this was going to be a big game because the amount of data that was going into it. I mean, they had like they had a guy who was just getting the data together from all the clubs and the teams worldwide. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it wasn't just like UK teams; it was worldwide teams. I mean, the amount of data that game's got in it is crazy for the time. And and you alluded to earlier, which people again forget you don't just go on the internet and do a CSV oh. dump of every player who's in, you, you have to research this stuff and go and find these people. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. I mean, it really, I mean, the internet was very, very young for, for, for the public at least uh, back when it was, when it had come out. I mean, I think when, what we talk about 1995, 94, 95. Um, so even, even then, if you'd have gone online, you wouldn't have found a lot of stuff about all the global team names and all that, that just wasn't, probably wasn't there. Um, so I don't think, you know, when you look back, you can think, say, well, okay, if you're really into football, you, you, can, un- you can kind of appreciate why people really took to it. You know, so plus it's a great game to play. It's a great arcade game, mm. you know, let alone all the management style stuff and all the other bits and pieces that are going on. It's a great game. So same question. Mm. And now... Now in 2020, and we're looking and we're looking back. You know, for, the, for looking back at those games that shaped generations, shaped mm. consoles, shaped uh, computers. People, people don't just talk about sensible world of soccer. Sensible, sensible soccer was on a Royal Mail postage stamp, right? That, so just for the benefit of everyone who listens from America, mm. the the Royal Mail in the UK released a set of I think it was eight. I've got a copy. I've got, I've got them literally on hand here. Uh, eight, I think it was eight um, video games that kind of shaped the, the the birth of this amazing industry, and one of those was Sensible Soccer. These were obviously dedicated to UK houses. That's that's how how that's big mad, and isn't it? it's, it's yeah. bonkers, absolutely. So, bonkers. How, so how does that sit now? Now that you know, mm. you know, n- not not then now. How do you do you what do you, do you have a, a pride, a kind of a, a <sighs> almost like. A, a, an odd smile can't believe it what's how do you feel about it um i would if it was cannon fodder <laughs> <laughs> it is look cannon fodder is in the same breath cannon fodder is um, in the same no, breath no, um, are they in the same universe yeah. <laughs> yeah it's in the same universe yeah. uh, there's a, and then we did do a crossover as well didn't we we did a crossover yeah um, exactly we did the cross um it's really surreal to be honest because and I, I've often sat here thinking to myself, like, you know, when I look, when I see, you know, people post stuff on Twitter or you see articles, it feels a bit surreal because for me at the time, I was just like a young guy just having fun, just drawing graphics, game developing, really. So looking back now, you think that's, that's pretty cool. You know, you, you, I mean, how many people can look back at their work and people are still remembering it and talking about it and playing it as well. I mean, let's not forget people are still playing it. You know, I mean, SWAS is being updated every year with all, 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 most, well, even a couple of times a year, there's new team data coming out. Um, I mean, I played it actually, I actually played it a few weeks ago and um, it just plays so well. You know, it's, you just pick up and play it and you can, you know, there's no messing around looking, going through hundreds of menus or waiting for an update to install. You just play, you know, just play the bloody game. You know, that's what it's about. So, yeah. But it's, it's, um, it's a bit surreal to summarise it. I think it's just a bit of a weird, weird feeling. I'm proud of, I'm proud of being part of it all. Uh, mm. And I'm, 
I'm pleased that you know the stuff we 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 worked on has been remembered for the end result. You know, not because of individuals or it's because it was a good game. You know, and that's that's the most important thing. It's a good game, and people remember it for that, which is great. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. And and say I know we're joking, but you know, can, Cannon fodder is absolutely in there as mm. the, the same thing. And I think because those those visuals and that feel, you know, that was very much the sensible thing at the time. You know, to to me, it was the the little guys. Mm. You know, that you you could have put them in a different sport. You could have put them in anything, and I'd have gone, oh, it's sensible. Yeah, that's mm. cool. Um, and uh, yeah, a- no, absolutely amazing. And say, I, you know, the thing that I was going to kind of take that question probably to as well is, you know, when me and, me and Soren were talking about this the other day, is the video game houses and computer games, software, software companies, when we were growing up, these were to us like bands. You know, to us, you were rock stars. Um, and you know, the thing that kind of sent where sensible kind of stood out is, you know, we got to see videos of you guys messing around, uh, sh- shooting things next to tanks for cannon fodder and mm. being goal scoring superstar heroes. And, and it's kind of like, you know, these are your, these are your heroes when you're growing mm. up. Um, and like you said, you know, it's a really salient point earlier about the internet. We didn't have that. We had computer games, magazines, and we had, that's what we had. So, you know, these are the people we kind of like, these are who we wanted to be. There you go. That's a bit weird, isn't it? We wanted to be you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, uh, why wouldn't you? It's like you get to talk to, now you get to talk to someone who play who created the game that you spent eons of hours on. Yeah. And to me, it's amazing because you talk about when you were a teenager, how you could just submit it. And of course, you know, here in the United States of America, we didn't have that. Like yeah. to us, someone who learned how to code, you were if you were lucky enough to live on the east or west coast, you had a chance of getting something before yeah. the internet. And one thing I would like to ask is, you mentioned now it's easier to develop. Do you think that it's easier to get into the industry now compared to then too, or do you think it like the whole bedroom coder scene is kind of dead now? Uh, that's a good question. I think I think what's happened is it's kind of it's almost like it's polarized a bit where you've got like the main, the main sort of uh, video game business is there, which is all your Xbox, PlayStation, PC gaming. And that's the big, big, big business side of it. And then it's gone that way, which is all your indie developers, which I indie developers always is a bit of a funny term because to me, it's always bedroom coders and small development teams. It's in, you know, it's where you can basically say, well, look, we, we're going to do our own thing. And we can publish it ourselves. Uh, and I think now it's, um, it's, I'd say it's easy to develop a game now, but I don't think it's as easy to make money from a game now. I think you, there's so many people developing and, set and making games that if you, unless you've got a really, really, really good business head on your shoulders, and you're prepared to work your backside off promoting it and getting it as, as seen as many places as possible. I think it's more of a case of a, a hobby that you can earn a few extra quid from, you know, um, on, on terms of small games are concerned. As far as getting into the main industry, I think the the fact that in certainly in the UK, we've got courses at uni for game development now. So you can actually go on a course and you can come out and then you can be taken on board with one of the big companies as a, as an intern, or you can get a, a job as a junior and you can work your way in that way. It's something we didn't have in the eighties or the nineties. It was more of a case of like, you know, you just showed up with a disc with your work on. And if there was somebody in that, in that company that day who liked the look of your face would have a look at the disc and say, yeah, that's cool. Um, come in for another interview. So I think the market's a lot, lot bigger now. And I think a lot of people are aware of it as a, as a, as a, as a form of employment as well. You know, I mean, back, back in the eighties, it wasn't seen as a proper job, <laughs> you, know, it was, it, you know, cause it didn't feel like a proper job. Um, whereas now I think it's become, you know, it has become a job for people rather than just being say, like a paid hobby. And certainly in the big companies. I mean, if you go to a big company, you know, you've got teams of people on, on one project. So, um, you know, when you look at the list of credits on some of the latest projects, it's like page after page after page. It's like a Hollywood blockbuster. You know, it just keeps going. 
crazy you know and when when we do it it was like three of us <laughs> or two of us <laughs> I, I i love that i i kind of i almost feel maybe it's the nostalgia creeping in mm. I, I i feel like there was a there was a period in time where that was more achievable and it was a, mm. it was a lovely time and a simpler time i sound like i'm now i'm old here we go uh, it's i think it was um i think it it I mean, I feel fortunate now. I didn't, I didn't at the time really realise what I was doing in terms of where I was in the timeline. But looking back now, I feel quite fortunate and I feel privileged that I was allowed to be part of that um, at that particular moment in time in the video game industry because it was a golden time. It was a time that uh, had innovations, not just with software, but with hardware. You know, I mean, now somebody... Not, I mean... <laughs> Do you guys get excited at the new Xbox or the new PlayStation? Are you like, oh, what's it got inside? What's it got under the hood? What's it got underneath? You know, do you you don't, do you? You know, it's no. like it's just the next generation. It's another number on the end. Um, but you think back to the 80s when Sega announced the Mega Drive Genesis. It's like, wow, this is like an arcade machine for my home. Um, you know, and when Nintendo released the Super Nintendo. It blew me away the graphics and then obviously they brought the n64 out and so on and so forth but each generation brought with it a layer of excitement not just for the software but for the hardware i that's gone that those days have really gone now you don't you don't find that which is a real shame you know it's a, but it can't be any different because the technology evolved so so far in advance of what we used to have that it wouldn't be it wouldn't be any different you know yeah. it, 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 it's so you know, it's a, it's um, I do feel I do feel privileged and that I was part of that 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 era of, of video game development. You know, it's uh, it's nice to look back on. Well, and I think I think we we in the video games fraternity, as well as flying the flag for the United Kingdom, are glad that you were a massive part of that. <laughs> well, well done you. So, quick quick fire final question. Mm. You, get, you get little time to think about this. One quick answer. All right. The Best video game of all time, in your opinion? Everyone's got everyone's got their one. Soren had Megalomania. What's yours? There's a game that I I I see. I play so many old games, uh, but I I think if there was a game that I would quite happily play forever, would be Galaga. Ah, oh, classic. Um, and I don't mean that. I don't mean that to take away from modern games or the scale of the big games. But for me. But then you've got Defender and Robotron. Defender beats Galaga, man. Sorry. Oh, yeah. no. Galaga um, beats Robotron. Defender. I mean, Robotron is another beats one. them all. You, you, can yeah. ro- you, can just, you can just zone out to those, can't you? Defender yeah. and Robotron. You can zone out to those. So, mm-hmm. do you know what? I'm going to go for Robotron. Oh, an amazing choice. I'm going to go for Robotron. I was going to say go. I'm going to go for Robotron because I know you can sit and... Once you get into the zone with that, you can just keep going. Yeah. There, there we go. Ro- Robotron. I, I can guarantee... Quicken- Quick, fast question for you. Yeah, go. Who's your favorite game, fellas, host, and why is it me? (laughs) Because I like your accent. (laughs) Yeah, that makes one of us. I hate having a southern accent. (laughs) I love it. I sound like I found. I find love at a family reunion. (laughs) That's amazing. Right, guys. One other thing I was going to say. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Um, I just forgot. Yeah, there was another another version of Sensible Soccer I worked on, which was the Jaguar version. I oh. did the, I did the version to the Jaguar. How wow. bad was the that? Graphics, you know, the Jaguar. Is that a bitch to code for? Well, I just did the graphics, but um, but it it again that's a machine that was that was kind of like you know um, mistreated by developers because it was it had a sixty eight thousand processor in it but it wasn't designed to be the main processor, as far as I know. But a lot of people just ported stuff from the Amiga and ST and got it running on the 68,000. So you effectively ended up with a load of ports from the Atari and, ST and Amiga running on a Jaguar. So, um, but I love the machine. Graphically, I love the machine. I love doing it. I mean, when you look at the, um, the graphics of Sensi Soccer, I've, I've took the original and I've enhanced them all. So uh, I'll send you. I'll send you one of the files over on Twitter. I'll send you over a file. You can have a look. You can see it. I think I did. I think on my web page, I put. A, I can't remember if I did a post. Or I was going to put a post up about it. Mm. But again, that's what I was talking about earlier about when you do a graphics conversion, take the original and just enhance it, but don't change it. 
you know, because I didn't do the original graphics, John did the original graphics. So, you know, I thought, well, I've got to enhance what he's done, but I can't change it. Because mm. if I change it, then it won't look the same as the original. So yeah. it won't be the original. So, uh, yeah, uh, another little bit of information there. <laughs> oh, amazing. Love it. Amazing stuff. I mean, I don't think we're ever going to talk to anyone else who's done anything for the Jaguar. Mm. <laughs> That's I, wish be... I, I, wish I, I wish it had got... Um, I would say the support it deserved, but I, th I don't think it deserved any support because of the way the Tari, you know, were, pr were promoting it and the way they treated it. Mm. But I wish it had come out earlier and I wish it had probably did a bit better than it did. I, I, I did like the machine, but again, it all comes down to money. You know, if, if, there's no point developing a project on a machine that's only going to sell like, you know, half a dozen units, you know, yeah. no matter what, what, you know, how much you love it. If it's not going to make money, then there's no point. There's yeah. No point doing it. Well, Steve, thanks for that. That was very enlightening. Finishing on uh, talking about a console that had a telephone for a joypad. So, uh, one, of, one of the most fascinating. It was bits. crap, basically, wasn't it? It was a crap joypad. <laughs> yeah. not, not good. Anyway. And you guys are from the country that decided we should have a controller with as many buttons as you want, but they all do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was awful, wasn't it? Right. Brilliant. Well, we're going to take a, a short break. We'll be back shortly and okay. we will be talking about topic two. We're back. We're back into the uh, second segment of uh, episode 20. Uh, and the topic that we will be talking about, very short, very sweet, very simple, lots to talk about, was the Commodore Amiga cut short in its prime? Interesting question. Uh, one that has been brought up by our guest, Stu Cambridge, and <clears throat> one that is uh, particularly pertinent to those who grew up in the UK and, and Europe specifically, more so than uh, North America. Um, the Amiga uh, for the uh, child of the 80s and 90s was either something that you did own and followed up the Commodore 64, 128, or ZX Spectrum CPC 464s of the past, uh, boasting unbelievable graphics and sound compared to what you had seen before or was something that one of your friends had because you had moved into the console scene which was thriving into the early 90s again particularly in the United Kingdom with the likes of the Sega Master System and the Nintendo having been successful and then pushing into the vastly successful 16-bit era of the SNES and the Mega Drive so it seems most appropriate that we talk to uh, one, one of the, the Amiga gods, I see, as, as, someone, as someone who is who is responsible for Amiga being coveted, heralded, and held in such high regards. Stu, you've got to go first. The Amiga, cut short in its prime. What's your thinking? I think it was. I think it was. I think it was robbed of a, of a, a good decade's worth of, uh, of gaming goodness from the Amiga. Uh, certainly from a game developer's point of view, I think that it would have... It would certainly have uh, allowed us to explore other things, you know, that, that, that maybe we we wouldn't have done with the PC. I mean, certainly like something like Cannon Fodder or Sensi Soccer, we could have evolved those projects onto another uh, another generation of Amiga machines. Um, but we didn't, you know, because the machine, Commodore screwed up. You know, they they buggered up the whole of the uh, the business model with the Amiga. And um, for me, I always felt like. It was a. It was almost like mourning of a friend when the Amiga died, because it wasn't just a machine to play games on. Because I played games on it as well. It was. A, it was a. It was work. It was a work machine, you know. And it was a bloody good work machine as well, you know. We, we and and it's just. I don't know. I look back and I think, God, you know. I mean, they brought out the AGA chipset, which gave you like two hundred fifty-six colours. Um, they increased the palette to sixteen point something million colours. So that kind of put it into the realms of what the PCs were doing at the time. And then that was it. It, it, it didn't go any further. And then years later, you hear that they had a, a Hombre chipset was being worked on, which would have given it a risk processor, 3D graphics. And you think, wow, you know, um, there's a AAA chipset, which was an enhancement of the AGA, which would have given it much greater graphics capabilities. So you think, so what would have happened if the Hombre chipset had actually got all the way through to being finished and had made it to marketplace and had come out on another machine, you know, like an Amiga 5000 or, you know, an Amiga, Amiga 1200 plus or whatever, 
and that would have given the PCs a run for their money. What would have happened? Because I, I, you know, you look at it and you think, well, the PC itself was was a big clunky box. It had no real kind of redeeming features. It was just a, a, a beige clunky box. You had a, a pretty, you know, hefty monitor. The Amiga was a much more slimline machine, more friendly for the user, uh, cheaper to, 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 to own, um, and I think easier to develop for. And uh, it's a shame that, that for things that went on in obviously Commodore, you know, that led to this machine never, never going, filling its full potential. You know, and I, I think that's a great shame. I think it's, um, it is a really interesting point about <clears throat> how, how everything went wrong with Commodore. Mm. Um, you know, again, saying growing up in the, in the eighties and, 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 and looking back now, not just at those systems, but also looking back at, you know, the likes of Commodore were, I mean, for those that are, know the football club Chelsea they used to be the prime shirt sponsor for Chelsea you know mm. you, you these Commodore was a big big name and like many of those uh those companies a, a few wrong decisions lead to a few worse decisions lead to wholesale collapse and it is a it's a, it is a really interesting question as to not just what would have happened for the Commodore as a platform that was was well loved and was a genuine contender in the gaming market but how could they <clears throat> under the right stewardship have directed what the pc market became because the pc market was to start with absolutely stank it, mm. it was horrendous it wasn't just expensive it was not great i mean a lot of early machines were were poor they, they certainly didn't have particularly great video game support the they were seen as those business type machines but say commodore was nicely prepped to kind of really go you know trailblaze i suppose Commodore actually tried to i mean like ibm did everything they could to avoid the mention of video games which is why they did the pc junior later on but like it's amazing to me that the amiga didn't get as big as it did because it's the first Compute or consumer PC to break the one megabyte of RAM under a thousand dollars mark, and it did it a year before IBM offered that option because they were still doing 640k, which should be enough for anybody. But it just never like here in America, it never took off. You never heard of an Amiga game, and yep. it's just fascinating that something with that much power. We heard about PCs, of course, because you'd see them anywhere, but you mm. never saw it. And it was more powerful than the PCs of the time, which is insane to me. And, and of course, you know, you talk, we talk about one, one good decision, one bad decision. You know, imagine those, those decisions lead to the, the conversations that would have absolutely led to the door of Microsoft. Because the, and there is no way, we know how things transpired, that had they have gone down a, um, I can't even tell you what the operating system was on an Amiga. What, what was, was it? I was, I mean, intuition was the... the um... The back end stuff on it, I think. Um, but you had Workbench, which was the yeah. graphical user interface. Yeah. Uh, and I, I know from the programming side, it was the um, the libraries now. I think it's called Intuition, which was the the, the underneath stuff. Yeah. But if you think, I mean, Workbench. I mean, there was. Um, I mean, I've got a, I've got a couple of four thousands down there, um, and I mean, they were really great machines. You know, they were really, really. Um, they they. <laughs> They they were almost like you know um, godlike <laughs> because as a yeah. as a computer the four thousand was for me was the ultimate Amiga and I know some people argue that you know the three thousand was a much better looking piece of hardware on a desk uh, which I I'm inclined to agree with a little bit because it it was a little bit more aesthetically pleasing but when you think about the way that the Amiga four thousand worked it had all the expansion potential that you needed. You know, you could put like a video toaster in it. You could put all sorts of the RTG graphics cards could go in it. So you could have this mega displays. So it was, it was state making a move, but it wasn't enough. And I think that if you look at say what's happened with Apple, like the way the Mac has just evolved and developed and they've created their own market. I think Amiga could have done that. I really, I think if they'd have got more into America and they, they took a foothold in America and the Americans adopted it, 
I think we would have seen Commodore rise to a similar, not necessarily the same level as Apple, but it would certainly create its own market. And it didn't. And that, that to me is a real shame. Because, I mean, like the Hombre chip sale, I was reading up on it a little while ago, and it was going to be like a risk processor. Well, that's what's in your phone. We have risk processors in our phones now. Most machines are using risk processors. They're everywhere. So it, it, it was obviously there, that, that, that little bit of, you know, that little bit of an idea to, to go that route was there, but it just was stumped out before I had a chance to, to bear fruit. Uh, it's a shame. You know, it's a real shame. What do, you, what do you think that did for uh, software developers at the time? Do you think that it was easier to either get into the industry or be in the industry or it more lucrative or less costly to be part of what the Amiga could do? Um, or do you think as, the, as, the, as Commodore started to kind of wither and drop from the vine that those mm. people all had the same opportunities with Sega and Nintendo? Um, I mean, certainly something like the Amiga, you could you could go and get like an Amiga 500 for like, was it 400 quid, uh, 400 pound, um, and you could you could get into games development there and then. You know, you could buy you know buy bits and pieces with a PC. You're looking at a thousand pound easy to get an equivalent machine, but then you'd have to get the software, uh, and then you'd have to get you know the relevant bits of you know software that you needed to do a particular job. So. I think with um, certainly getting into games development, the uh, the Amiga certainly made it easier to get into games development. And you couldn't do that with the consoles because you needed a license. So you needed to be approved by Sega or Nintendo to even have a sniff at developing for a console. You know, that's another thing. I mean, you, you, you if you want to have a develop a game for a Mega Drive or a Genesis, forget it. You know, you, you've got no chance. You've got to be established. You've got to have offices. You've got to have a, a development company. An Amiga game, yeah, write one up, send it to a publisher. If they like it, they publish it. You know, and I don't think it was just quite the same PC games. I think PC games were a little bit, bit more restricted in terms of getting games published on them. Um, I might be wrong, but I just thought the it was more accessible as a as a platform. And I think if it had evolved, then you would have seen people getting into 3D, because the the you know the next chipset that was going to come out was a 3D enabled chipset. So then you would have had the likes of the PlayStation 1 would have come out and Amiga owners would have said, well, we've already got that. We've already been doing 3D already. This is old. This is old. You know, we've seen 3D. But when the PlayStation came out, everyone's going, wow, that's incredible. How does it do this for that price? So there's so many different avenues. When you start analysing and thinking about it, you think, yeah, the Amiga could have branched into that area. And it didn't. It just didn't. And for us, it's certainly a sensible we struggled on the PC, you know. Um, I mean, there was a sensible. I mean, I, I left the company just before, I think just as there's 3D Sensible Soccer came out on the PC. I think I left just as that was coming out. Uh, and that was, from what I know, it was pretty awful. It wasn't, wasn't very, wasn't very um, technically, well, I, I say I, it wasn't awful, but it was certainly not as good as it could have been. But that's because of struggling with 3D, you know. Um, Whereas if it was an Amiga, we could have taken the, the technology we already developed and just carried on, and we would have gathered our momentum and moved with it. You know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I do wonder. There's a lot of instances where that's happened with technology, where you've got a lovely piece of hardware, and there's a great big user base, and it just stops dead because of a decision that someone's made in a company to go a different route. You know, it's uh, it's it's quite frustrating because you can see the potential as a developer. You can see the potential of something, and as I say, I've been reading up on what what the Amiga was going to be. You think, oh my god, this would have been amazing. This would have been actually brilliant. I think what you're saying there is is right about the Amiga. The Amiga at the time, you know, for for those maybe that that weren't there or don't, didn't know, is like you say, it was this isn't something that, that died because it wasn't good. You know, I'm looking at those other things that, that failed. And of all the things that come to mind, the one that maybe um, gets, gets a, a, bad, a bad draw here is maybe the Sega Dreamcast. The Dreamcast could have gone mm. on to something decent. You look at things that failed like the Saturn. The Saturn was shite. It, um, you look at the Jaguar, it was shite. You look at, you know, those that failed weren't good. This at the time was... Yeah absolutely prime in the market 
it, it was one of the, the, the greatest options out there. Had that base, you know, like you say, everything was right. It wasn't, it wasn't, a, it was, it was management and people based decisions that just made it go pop. Um, and, and it's almost, I guess, equally as, <clears throat> as fascinating that someone took the decision to not bring it back from the grave. You know, how many stories have we seen? You know, I'm sure the US is the same in the United Kingdom where things go pop, someone buys it for a pound and then they, you know, like a phoenix from the flames, up it comes again. Mm. Atari is a perfect example. There's been like three Ataris. Yeah, it's exactly, exactly. And, it, and it's, it, it just, it never did. Um, and it's amazing now, obviously it was so many years ago, it sort of very quickly gets confined to like being you know the ghost of christmas past but i don't have to spend too long thinking myself like no that was that was the thing i was envious of mm. that you know they my mates had these these options that i i didn't have they had a system that was better graphically had better sound had a, a mouse capability which made games like camera for example much easier to to play i was always aware that mouse porting to consoles was was mm. tough um you know, the, the concept as well that always used to make me laugh. I was lucky enough because I had the Commodore 64 that I grew up with. I, I recognize this, but those around me who grew up just, just with consoles, the, the, the concept to them of having a, a demo disc was alien. Because obviously you can't have a demo cartridge for the Mega Drive. Um, imagine that, yeah, the, this issue of the magazine is 40 pounds. Brilliant. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, all of those things. And, 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 and say, like you said earlier, the, um, the way you could pick one up and get into games development. Or I remember um, art packages or music packages or things that people did to be creative. And, and I, I wonder, I wonder if, if it wasn't for those bad business decisions that there, there was a place in the market, even, even not as competition to the PC, just, just as a, a variation on, mm. on gaming that was effectively um, a console, but with keys, with a, its own yeah. operating system that had all these things. It, is, it definitely was, was gone too soon and never had that, that chance to, to maybe die a more graceful death. I think it... It did seem to go very quickly, didn't it? When it, when it went, it, it did seem to just... Because they brought the CD32 out, um, which I... My brother bought one of those. He had one of those, which was, wasn't bad, but it was, it was literally just an Amiga 1200 with, with the CD-ROM, wasn't it, really? The CD32. And now it's stupid expensive to get one. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was. Yeah, it was very, and 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 it was it was, and then it just kind of died. It just disappeared. And you think it, it when you look at it, the way that it, it went. I mean, you've got like Linux today is for me feels like using an Amiga in terms of the way it feels when you lose a Linux machine because it's kind of like it's slightly outside the norm, solid machine. And the Amiga could have gone that route because it was a solid machine. And like you say, you know, it might not have been a like you know replace a PC, but it could have existed alongside the PC, mm. you know. And the PC would have gone that way, and the Amiga would have gone that way, and all the creatives and all the you know production stuff would have been done on Amigas, like they were initially with Video Toaster and all the you know the art and the music packages, and the PC would have retained that side of the for, for whatever they were doing. Um, I don't know. I mean, you look at you look at the way that the um, the fan base today of the Amiga is still, it's so strong. People are still using them today. There's a lot of people who are still, you know, um, doing stuff on the Amiga. They're still promoting the Amiga. So it's definitely made a huge impact and not just for the games that people played for actually the usability of it as a machine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember, I remember um, being blown away the first time I saw it multitasking. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, because uh, a PC, you couldn't do that on a PC. It was either that program running and close that one and then open that one. Because um, even on the PC, it wasn't the original, P the early PCs, they couldn't do multitasking very well. On the first, first one of the Windows, it was pretty, pretty ropey. But the Amiga had proper multitasking. So um, I, just, I just feel like a whole part of our history is as geeks and computer heads I feel like part of us has been a bit robbed of something because yeah, of the yeah. way that, that that particular type of technology was, was cut off in its prime. 
yeah. yeah. And, and that's, uh, it's it, quite it, sad when you start thinking about it because you start looking at all the, the little clues of where it was going to go and you kind of piece together like, you know, developers, you know, like the Bitmap Brothers, you know, the stuff they were doing, you know, you've got a lot, a lot of the... Um, I love the Bitmap uh, Brothers stuff. Yeah, I mean, the, the absolute quality stuff they were doing. You've got uh, like all the European developers, like guys in Germany and, the, the, you know, some the stuff they were doing. You think all these guys who are very talented, what would they have done on an Amiga 5000 or, or equivalent machine? It, it, you know, mind boggles what, what would have been achievable. And uh, unfortunately, it's going to be confined to the past and we will never know. Um, no. Is it? Is I know it, my flux capacitor. <laughs> this is true. But... No, I, I've got an interesting question, though. I mean, if, if we're agreeing that Commodores came to an end kind of well before their time, you know, what are your thoughts on Lionel Richie's solo career? Yes. Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a, it's a totally with the greatest question. question that will ever be asked on this show. I'm going to dance <laughs> on that ceiling in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Can I buy drugs from you then? <laughs> I, uh, I, I love the fact that Soren manages to ask a question that sounds at the start like it's going to be so genuine and then just literally <laughs> falls off a cliff. It is a gift. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, so, I, so I think on that note, the, the, the question that I'm left asking, which is for the US and the UK audiences, is, is it better to have loved and to have lost oh, yes. than to never have been given the chance to have loved at all? I don't know. Ask your wife and my kids. <laughs> hey, <laughs> there we go. Right, guys, we'll wrap it up now. I just want to say a massive, massive thank you to Stu Cambridge. Thanks. My pleasure. No thank problem. you for coming on, Stu. No yeah, worries. My you. pleasure. Great talk. Anytime. To you. Soren, always a pleasure, uh, especially as I have to work with him day in, day out, and I've known him for 37 years. Thanks, Soren. Uh, yeah, no, anytime. <laughs> <laughs> and... Derek, you know that is a face that only I can love. Thank you, as always. <laughs> I. It's an honor to be insulted with something that hilarious. You know it. And, People pay uh, good money to be insulted like that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Right, guys. I pay well, extra for Tinder to get insulted like that. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, to give Zach a fighting chance to edit this. And from all of us at Game Fellas, see you later. Cheers. Catch you later. The, the most commonly asked question is does it matter if I swear um, it dear doesn't. fucking god no <laughs> <laughs> it, it. Damn. and I gotta do a whiz quiz but I told him uh, I'm gonna <laughs> fail for something but I got proof I can do it <laughs> <laughs> a whiz quiz <laughs> amazing yeah I um, yeah, can't imagine you'd pass with flying colours Oh, I passed with flying colours, all right. I mean, it's not a case of... We have had actual issues. It's it's not a case of you being so in love with retro that you're using, uh, like, a 56K modem or something. (laughs) No one would use a 56K modem in the right fucking mind. No, it's all all 14400 here. Yeah. (laughs) He's got semaphores and smoke signals, damn it. I just gotta say, the way Soren's sitting to where the white chair comes over his shoulders every now and then, he looks like the bad guy in an '80s action movie. <laughs> <laughs> he, he does. He's a he's a cat short of being a true. Yeah, villain. you need you need to have a cat to go that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know where mine went. Oh, she's passed out on top of. <laughs> Um, and then the second topic that you suggested that I've shortened to essentially was the Amiga cut short in its prime, which is uh, really, good. really interesting yeah. for, for, for us. So, you right. that's not a Genesis or Super Nintendo. <laughs> yeah, that's not a console. <laughs> what do you mean it's got a keyboard? Damn, these home computer users. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, to I- me, the music to example to use is Judas Priest. Oh, I like Judas Priest as well. Well, because they had a lead singer who joined the band after he had been in a cover band. And they had to hear him at a concert. Mm. And he showed... Uh, something I'm going to back. I mean, I'm just going to go ahead and assume he's, he's risked a fart and it's gone horribly wrong. 
I mean, he's <laughs> he's been knocked off the stage. Yeah, <laughs> yes, he, he has. Exit stage left. Exit yeah. stage left. 